good morning, church. How are we doing today? So good to see everyone. Just wanna give a shout out to those watching with us online, all those gathered in the house today. And I'm excited as we kick off the first part in our series called Coffee Mug Christianity. And we're gonna be looking at some of the most well-known favorite verses that are in the Bible that find themselves on the front of coffee mugs. And there's no better way to start your day with than some coffee, some morning wake up, hopefully not coffee like Folgers in your cup, but some sort of coffee. Do we have any coffee lovers in the house? I don't know about you, but I enjoyed that cold brew this morning and thankful for Matsi Coffee and David putting that on for us. Uh, but our coffee mugs, great way to start the morning, often have something motivational on them. You can find coffee mugs with things like this that when you wake up, Man, they're just getting you excited for the day. Work hard, dream big, right? You've got a dream, I'm gonna accomplish it. I got my goal, when, I, when I'm sipping my coffee, I can look at that, I get excited. Live every moment, every moment counts, every day. If I'm still alive, I'm still breathing, every moment counts, and we can look at mugs like that as we're drinking our coffee, or for those maybe who aren't Christians, tea, maybe if you're drinking that, but no. We've got our morning motivation, and there's no better place to kind of get that in the morning and get us encouraged and going through our day. And you can Google motivational mugs, and you can find websites full of mugs that are going to motivate you. And over the years, I've collected quite a few inspirational mugs. And it's not because I'm a collector or a hobbyist or looking for fresh inspiration. It's because I'm a teacher. And if you don't know, the most popular gift to give teachers, apparently, are mugs. And after 23 years of teaching, every December and May, my, my cupboards get full of new mugs. And so we've got this inspiration. And, and you know that one there? It says, best teacher ever. And so I look at that in the morning, and I'm saying, man, I'm just believing that. I'm going into the day. Great attitude. And this next one, though, it says this, that, that a teacher want, changes the world one lesson at a time. And that's great, one lesson at a time. I'm sure if we were to go around, we've all got maybe a teacher in our life as we look back who's made an impact on our life and we're investing in the future of America. And that sounds great, but probably on the other side of the mug, it should say that teachers can also lose their mind one lesson at a time. Because the reality is, man, at the end of the day, maybe someone got in a fight or people were being disrespectful and no one wanted to kind of learn that day. And, and the reality is the greater picture is that it can be both exhausting and rewarding, both at the same time. And see, the truth is, when we're looking at these common and, and well-known life verses that will find themselves on the front of a coffee mug, we often don't see the whole context. We don't understand the full picture of the promise that is on front of those mugs. And we can understand that the scripture that we find, the verses that are in the Bible are meant to encourage and correct and challenge and teach. But the challenge can be, they can also be misapplied and misunderstood, misquoted, taken out of context. When we don't understand the full picture of what they are saying. Because we all know there's probably some verses in the Bible that most likely are not gonna find themselves on the front of a coffee mug. For example, if you're following along in the notes, Isaiah 34, two through three, I haven't found this yet. It says, the Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is on their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will stink and the mountains will be soaked with their blood. Now, I don't know, that's probably not the theme verse for the ladies' event coming up, right? That's, that's not making its way on any coffee mugs that were given out at church. It's probably most likely not gonna be there. And we're thinking, okay, so some verses maybe aren't gonna make it on front of the coffee mug. And sometimes people we know can kind of pick random verses and kind of use those verses to support their viewpoint or their agenda or kind of their uh, specific type of what they would think is the correct theology. And in fact, 
Christians have been accused of sometimes just cherry picking verses, the ones that we like, the ones that sound good, and maybe we'll ignore the ones we don't. And sometimes people will grab certain verses of the Bible to try to discredit the Bible, to get us to question our faith. And maybe you've been asked before and, and thinking through, okay, well, Jeff, do you believe in unicorns? And I would say, well, no. I mean, my girls like watching My Little Pony growing up, and that's a great little cartoon, but I don't think unicorns are real. And well, did you know that unicorns are in the Bible? I thought you believed in the Bible, and nine different times it talks about unicorns in the Bible. Isaiah 34, seven says this, and the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Now that's a crazy verse. And, and people will look at verses like this, people who are critical of the Bible or wanna challenge things and say, hey, did you know really the whole Bible is full of just mythical stories of whales that swallow people and unicorns that soar through the air and mountains that are soaked with blood. We read these stories and they'll, they'll kind of say, well, maybe the Bible is dangerous. Maybe the Bible isn't to be trusted. It's full of things that we can't even depend on. And Dan Kimball, in, in his book, How Not to Read Your Bible, recently read this book, and it brought about a lot of great ideas on how we can defend our faith. And, and this book says it's making sense of the anti-women, anti-science, pro-violence, pro-slavery, and other crazy-sounding parts of Scripture. If you're a student of the Bible and you've read through Genesis all the way to Revelation, you know there are some puzzling parts of Scripture. There are some parts of Scripture that maybe sound like they're, they're crazy, like what is happening here? Mountain soaked with blood and, and, and people being killed off and maybe pro-slavery and all these different ideas that people will take and kind of try to run with that, well, maybe the Bible can't be trusted. Maybe the, the Bible isn't the place to go for answers. But what we need to understand is that context controls the meaning of Scripture. Context and understanding the context of the greater picture is so important when we're reading through Scripture. Dan Kimball says this. He says that never read a Bible verse. Never read a Bible verse is a reminder that every Bible verse is written in a context, in a specific time period, for a specific person, and every Bible verse fits within a larger story. We need to understand that context controls the meaning of Scripture. And what the good news is, if, if you're wondering how can I dive deeper into the Bible, how can I make sense of some of these commonly objected to Scriptures, how can I understand how to defend my faith and the inerrancy of Scripture and things that people will pull out and say, this is why the Bible should not be true, we're actually going to be doing a book study on that book this fall as one of our life groups, so make sure you come back on the 27th as we have our life group Sunday, and we're going to dig into some of those topics. But in our series today, and as we go through this series together, we're going to look at some of the well-known common verses that will find themselves on the front of mugs, but we need to understand if we don't fully understand what the verse is or how to apply it to our lives, then maybe then maybe it shouldn't be on the front of the mug if we don't seriously understand what it's talking about. Because as we're going to see, if we don't know what comes before or after, we may be missing out on the greater picture of what God's Word is saying to us. And so we're going to dive into today one of my favorite verses that we find often on the front of coffee mugs. And we're going to kind of zoom out and look at the greater picture today. But Today's verse, if you're following along on the Awaken City app, you can follow along with our notes today, is this. It's Romans 8, 28. This is our very first mug in coffee mug Christianity. Romans 8, 28. And this is a great verse. This is a great promise to have. But the question would be, sometimes it can be misunderstood. Misunderstood to believe that God only will bring good things in our life that life is supposed to be comfortable, 
that around every corner there's something good, every dark cloud has a silver lining. If you just go far enough over the rainbow, there will be the leprechaun with the pot of gold. You just gotta believe it. And we can have these ideas and kind of misinterpret what the promise is. And so today we're gonna uncover, we're gonna unpack, we're gonna kind of zoom out and try to understand, you know, who was this book written to? Who wrote it? What is the context? And we're gonna look at the verses before and after to get a picture of the promise of Romans 8, 28. And so we're gonna begin this morning looking at the book of Romans. When we think about who wrote the book, we know the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans. He wrote a little bit more than, than half of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote this book to the church of Rome. He wrote it from Corinth in AD 57. We know that he was writing to the Christians there to try to help them understand what the gospel is. What are the implications for our life in the gospel? What does it even mean? And it's full of so many important themes within the Bible. In fact, the book of Romans has been considered by many to be the single greatest book on Christian faith that's in the Bible. It's all about sin and salvation and reconciliation and redemption and God's grace. It's full of these wonderful things. It lays out in a clear and concise and well-ordered way what the gospel is all about. But what we also know is what's interesting is Romans 8, chapter 8, is considered by many theologians to be the greatest chapter in all the book. In, in all of the Bible, the greatest chapter is often referred to as the great eight. In fact, Donald Gray Barnhouse said that if you were to drop your Bible on the ground, that it should automatically open up to Romans chapter eight because it's been turned to so many times. That if our Bible just happens to fall on the ground or gets knocked off the shelf, that it should open up to Romans chapter eight because we've turned to it so many times because it's full of so much of what the, the richness of what the gospel story is. It's about grace and the gospel and about the glory of God and it should be turned to often. And so when we understand the book of Romans and, and Romans chapter eight and look at the verses that come before and after 828, we begin to understand what Paul was trying to help us as we live out this promise that was given in God's scripture. And so this morning we're gonna read verses 26 through 30 together and then we're gonna unpack some of the truths that we can find about this promise. And this is what Romans 8, 26 through 30 says. It says, likewise the spirit also helps us in our weakness for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts know what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. In verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so, if we're gonna begin to understand this verse and the promise that's from it, we have to be, begin to first look at what this word good means. Because my idea of good and your idea of good and God's idea of good may not be the same. For example, many of you know probably that uh, Pastor Billy is an avid cyclist. He loves to get up early and you can follow on social media his rides and adventures down A1A and, and he loves it. But if you were to ask me, do I wanna get up at 5 a.m. And, and fight the crazy traffic of Florida and in the heat, I would say that's not my idea of a good time. I like the stationary bike. I like to sit where I can be in the AC and watch the TV. That's what I would want. We can look at, there we go, we can look at the same situation, the same set of kind of circumstances, and, and one person says, yeah, that's good. The other person, not so much. 
For some, they may love fishing, love to go out to fish, and it's relaxing, it's fun. Other people, not my idea of, of a good time, right? Because it's boring, or I never catch anything. It's messy, it's smelly, and, and I don't want anything to do with fishing. Some people on their day off, the place they want to be is the beach. I want to be at the beach, I want to soak up the sun and just be near the waves, and other people say no. It, it, the sand gets everywhere, I gotta clean the car, it's crowded, it's too hot. You know, put me at, at the pool under the umbrella, because that's not my idea of a good time. And so what we need to understand, well, well, whose idea of good are we talking about? What does good actually mean? And so the definition of good needs to be understood to understand the promise that is revealed in this, this verse. And so we begin with that, the definition of good the first part of Romans 8.28 is often the part that gets on front of the coffee mug. But they often don't maybe put the second part that says for those who love God, those who are called according to their purpose. But then we gotta ask ourselves, well, what's the purpose? And that's where verse 29 helps to understand what the purpose is. Verse 29 tells us this, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among brethren. So God's purpose in the good and the bad is that you and I would look more like his son, Jesus. That's the purpose, that each and every day that we would look more like Jesus. And so the definition, if you're following along, is that to become more like Jesus in our everyday lives. The primary good that Romans 8.28 is pursuing is not a better circumstances, a, a better house, a better job. No, it's a, it's a better you that becomes more like Jesus, that looks more like Jesus. That's the good, that's the context of what this is talking about, that that's what God's will is for you. That's his ultimate goal that with the circumstances that we come at, that come at us each and every day, that, that they're working at us and developing in us character and more of the likeness of God. And Paul is not saying here that everything that happens in life is good. He's not saying that that cancer diagnosis is good, that that betrayal from a friend, that job loss, those, those things that are hard and painful and difficult, he's not saying that those are good. And we can look at certain events and we can look at things in our life and we say, well, I can't see how God could use that for something good. I can't see the good in that. And this is, this is hard and we wonder why life is so hard. And there are some things that we walk through that aren't good. But David Guzik reminds us of this, he says, God is able to work all things, not some things. All things, it says, he works for the good together, not in isolation. That together they're working. Paul's not saying that all things work out the way we want. That all sickness is healed. That uh, every problem is, is overcome immediately. That's not what Paul is saying. But he is saying that God works in all things that God works behind the scenes for our long-range good, that ultimately God has a plan and a purpose, that he can work those things together for good. And so we gotta understand, he also says, though, that it's, it's a promise for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. The promise are for those who believe that you and I, that as believers, that we can have confidence that God is in control, that those things that happen in life that maybe don't seem good in the moment, that we may not understand, that God can still redeem them, that God can still make them good in his time, that is not always our time. But that's his ultimate goal that we understand from this verse is, is God's goal is working for us to be more like his son, to conform us in his image. That's the ultimate goal. That's God's will for your life, is that you would look more like his son, Jesus. But the reality is, unfortunately, we live in a fallen world where evil is prevalent, where we do walk outside of our doors and we can experience things, heartache and loss and, and pain, and 
We need to understand, though, how do we deal with those things when they come at us? And we see from Scripture time and time again that we serve a God who's able to take things that were meant for evil and he can still transform them into something good. That throughout those process, that God is, wants to do something in us as well. And the second thing, if you're following along, is this verse reminds us of the importance of development. That God wants to mature us. He wants to mature our faith. He wants not to just bring these things for our own happiness, but for our holiness. That he wants to do something in us through the process, through those hard times, that he can work things together for good. And often God does those through times of stretching. You know, I think about a man in the Old Testament who encountered a lot of setbacks, a lot of heartache, a lot of pain and trouble. Everywhere he turned, it seemed to not go his way. And his name is Joseph. If you know the story of Joseph, Gen Genesis 37 through 50, you can read Joseph's story. And he begins as this young man who has this dream that one day he would lead the family. And no one in his family liked the dreams. The brothers were jealous. And so eventually they took Joseph and they threw him in a pit to die. They wanted to get rid of him. They, were, they did not like the dream that he had and the favor that his father had shown him. But they decided after they threw him in the pit, hey, let's sell him into slavery. Let's get some extra cash at least. Let's not just kill him off. So they sell him into slavery. Is that good or bad? That's bad. And Joseph ends up in Egypt. He works his way up. He remains faithful to God. He becomes uh, in charge of Potiphar's house. And you know the story that Potiphar's wife one day hits on Joseph, tries to seduce him. But Joseph says no, and he sticks to what he knows is right. And that decision lands him in prison. Good or bad? Bad again. Joseph is in prison, and yet he still remains faithful, and, and he makes relationships, and he works his way up with and gets favor among the prisoners and, and the guards, and he interprets a dream, and, and one of the other people is, is let go, and he says, I'm going to get you out, Joseph, and then he's forgotten about. He spends two more years in prison, good or bad, and here's Joseph. And he's in prison, and you could look back at his life, and you could say his life was filled with injustice and rotten luck. And that's true. But God was doing something throughout the whole process. That God was working. He was developing his character. He was working in his heart. He was developing perseverance. And he had a plan, and he had a purpose. And what I love in this story is at the end of Joseph's life, we know that he went from the pit to prison, to palace, where he becomes second in command over all of Egypt, second to, to Pharaoh. And it's towards the end of his life where his brothers come to him, not even knowing that it's him, and they're searching for food. It's famine throughout the year, and God had given Joseph favor to be able to prepare Egypt for this favor of, of having and saving food for the land. And they come, and they're searching for food, and, and Joseph encounters them. They don't even know it's him, and, and he has an opportunity. He can retaliate. He can ignore them. He can lash out. But remember what happens, and we see this verse in Genesis 20. But as for you, he says to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day so many people would be alive. What Joseph's brothers meant for evil, God used. It was part of the, the plan. It was divine providence that God was doing something through this, that Joseph continued to trust God. He continued to rely on God. God was doing a work in his life through this. And by God's grace, he was not only able to save his family, but he was able to preserve the people and the people of God in this land, that God had a purpose in ultimately from that pit to the prison, up all the way to the palace, that there was a purpose in what he was doing. And those challenging parts of life, those hard parts of, of life, we can look at and say, well, even if it was meant for evil, that we serve a God who can still work those things together for good. That even in those 
seasons of darkness or those chapters of our life that seem to be more setbacks than, than moving forward, that God can work those things together for good. And he often wants to do something in us in the process. So number one, we need to remember the definition of good. Number two, we need to understand that through those seasons that God's working in our heart, he wants to mature us, he wants to develop us, that he's still in control. And number three, if you're following along, is the driving force. What can we rely on? What power do we have to sustain us and to give us the comfort or to give us the help that we need when we're walking through those seasons? Because the reality is life can be full of challenges. In fact, the number one reason reported that people stop believing in God is because of suffering. They say there is no God. Look at the pain and suffering. Look at what happened in my life. That would, that would never happen if we served a good God. And, and look at these things. And, and, and this idea of suffering keeps people from believing in God. And maybe you've experienced some of those things. And you've asked those questions of, of why. And why did my parents get a divorce? And why did I get this chronic illness? And, and why did I get this job loss? And we can begin to wonder why are things so hard? But we've got to remember that Romans, that Paul is writing to, the, the people of Rome, they were dealing with challenging times as well. They were going through seasons that were hard for them. And what I love about Romans chapter 8 is it is full of a reminder of who our help is and where we get our power from. In fact, in the book of Romans chapter 8, it uses the word Holy Spirit 19 times. 19 times in chapter eight alone is all using the word Holy Spirit to remind us about our, where we get our power from. If you remember Jesus, as he ascended up into heaven, he told his disciples, I want you to go and I want you to wait because when I send the Holy Spirit, you will receive power. And one of the greatest mistakes that we can make is to try to do God's will without God's power. That we've been given the power of the Holy Spirit and throughout Romans chapter eight, verse, ver, um, chapter eight, we see Paul continue to say it. And I wanna revisit verses 26 and 27 as we look at this strength that was given to sustain us through those hard times. Paul tells us this, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercessions for us with, with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. That you and I, even if we don't know what to pray, we don't know what to say, we're in a moment where we're just filled with grief or we're filled with heartache and we don't even have the words to say. This scripture reminds us that as believers, we have someone who advocates on our behalf that will go in front of the Father and is able to pray on our behalf according to God's will, that we have this power to sustain us that even when we don't know what to say, that when we're going through these difficult times that the Spirit is joined inside of us to help us and to be able to express to the Father what we're going through. And I love what A.T. Robinson says. He puts it this way. The Holy Spirit lays hold of our weaknesses along with us, and it carries his part of the burden facing us as if we're carrying a log, one at each end. And I love that, that picture, that whatever we're carrying, whatever the burden is, whatever the weight is, that we're carrying this long log and, there, and there's someone on the other side. It says the Holy Spirit is there, that he's working in us, he's working through us, that he's our advocate, he's come to comfort, to help, to convict, to strengthen, to empower, and that we don't have to go through those hard seasons alone. It says that the Holy Spirit is there to give us power, to give us strength, that we have someone on the other side that is always walking through us, that we're never alone, that the same power who raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. 
That's found in Romans chapter eight as well. That wonderful promise that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in you and me. And sometimes the greatest mistake that we can make is to try to do God's will without God's power. And in this chapter, we get that reminder that we need to understand the definition of good. We need to understand that there's development, but then also that we've been given this driving force. We've been given this power to sustain and to help us and who's our advocate that goes to the Father even when we don't know what to say. And so the fourth thing that we can see as we're going through is dependability. The dependability. When we read Romans 8, 28, when we read the promise that is before us that God can work things together for good, can we really depend on that promise. Because a promise is only as good as the person who's making it, right? I could promise to show you how to surf. Hey, this is how you surf. You gotta get up quick. You gotta get your balance. You gotta catch the waves. But the source isn't reliable because I've never surfed. I don't know how to surf. I've seen people surf. I've seen people and watched movies of people surfing, but, but the promise doesn't line up with the ability. I don't have the ability, the authority, or the track record to teach you how to surf. But we go to this promise, the promise that's given by God, and this is given by the creator of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, all-powerful, all-knowing. He's never failed. He has a track record. He has a track record throughout Scripture of taking those things that are ashes and turning them into something beautiful. He's taking those things that are broken and restoring them. And he's got a track record of of taking things that are painful and turning them into something good. And I think there's no better picture of that than the cross. That Jesus was beaten and betrayed and shed his blood on the cross for you and for me. But God used it to redeem Humanity, that out of death came life, life everlasting, that God is our Jesus, he's our living hope, that what was meant for evil, that this shedding of blood was something that was meant to redeem all of humanity, that God is able to take those things that were meant for evil and turn them into something good, and he's got a track record. He can be depended on, that he is able to, to put those things together. And so when we think about the things that were given and dealt with in life, those hard parts, we've got to understand the greater perspective when we're handed those puzzle pieces of life. And I brought this puzzle this morning. I've got three daughters. They love to do puzzles. Me, not so much. But when they're doing puzzles, here's what I know is they always have to have the the front of the puzzle out to look at. They need the front of the picture. This one says dog days. I thought it would be good since we're kind of in some dog days of summer right now. It is hot out there. But if you can see, when you're putting a puzzle together, you've got to have the picture before you. You've got to have the goal in front of you. You've got to understand what the picture is as we're looking at those. And so when we get looking at the kind of the puzzle of life, we need to understand what the ultimate goal is. And as we've established today, the goal, the ultimate goal that God has for us is that we would be conformed to the image of his son. That's the picture that's on the outside of the puzzle box of life. And so when we are given a puzzle piece of disappointment, a puzzle piece of discouragement, of of sickness or whatever, what we often try to do is hold it up to a puzzle box of comfort, of control, of health and wealth. And yet, those puzzle pieces, when we understand the greater picture, that know they're making us into the image of Christ. When we understand the greater picture, then it puts it in perspective. Because each one of those pieces has a final and ultimate goal, that God is working those things together for our good. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's verse 31 in Romans 8. And so we get these wonderful promises about what God wants to do in and through our lives. And I wanna end today by sharing verses 29 and 30 
again as we reflect on the meaning of what this wonderful promise is. And verse 29 through 30 says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among brethren. So we understand what we're to be conformed to. But then he says in verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, then he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so what we need to understand in these two verses are what theologians will call the golden chain of redemption. The golden chain of redemption, there's five chains that are un breakable, the five chains that would be referred to is that God, who he foreknew, he also predestined. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. And so we understand what this promise is, that there's this promise of eternal security. And sometimes we'll read a verse like this, though, and we get caught up in the P word, predestination. People begin to lose their mind. Are we talking about election and free will? And, and, and people will debate all those sorts of things, which is fine. If you're in our 201 class on minor doctrine, we go down this idea of election and free will and the sovereignty of God. But here's what Paul, I believe, was trying to convey to his audience that was reading this, is that God is ultimately in control, and we can have assurance that we can have assurance that what God started, that he will finish, that he is dependable. And I don't know if you noticed this, but the very last word in verse 30 there was glorified. And glorified is in the past tense, but yet it's referring to something that has not yet happened. It's referring to something that has not yet happened. Only God, who stands out of time and space, can declare something to already have happened that hasn't yet. Only God can do that. That we will one day be glorified. That means that we will be like Jesus, that sin will be removed. And so Paul is reminding us here that God can be depended on. That he who began a good work in you will complete it. That he is working to complete that, something that he started that we can trust God, that he's working those things together for good. It's already happened. That day when we see Jesus face to face will come about. And Paul, in those words, have used that in the past tense to bring about the fact that it is a done deal. Warren Wearsby says this. He says, the believer never need to faint in times of suffering and trial because he knows that God is at work in the world. And he has a perfect plan. God has two purposes in the plan, our good and his glory. And ultimately, he will make us like Jesus Christ. And best of all, God's plan is going to succeed. We may not always understand the puzzle pieces that were dealt. We may not understand how they fit together, but what we understand what the final picture looks like, that the final picture is being conformed like, like Jesus, that one day that we will rise from the grave in glorified bodies. We will see Jesus face to face. We will be like Jesus and with Jesus. And what does that mean? Well, it means no more doctors, means no more pain, means no more sickness, no more heartache, that there will be a time when that happens, when we see Jesus and when we're risen up with him into the new heaven. But what does that mean for you and I here and now? Well, it means that God's dependable. It means that the Alpha and Omega, the God who can look at the beginning of time and he can look at the end of time, that he's able to work all of those things together for good. That what he started, he's going to finish. The work that he's doing in our lives, that he will bring about completion. Because that's the type of God that we serve. He is 
the Alpha and the Omega. And the picture on the front of the box, the understanding of what the ultimate goal in life is, is so important. And as we end today, I want to read together Romans 8, 28. If we'll put that up on the screen as we begin to understand the, the perspective and the clarity that we get from this wonderful promise that we find in Romans 8, 28. Let's say it aloud. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so when you're going through a hard time, where do you go to for hope? You see, the promise of Romans 8.28 is that no moment of suffering is wasted, that no tear is wasted, that God can transform those things through the goodness of him for our good and for his ultimate glory, that the things that we're walking through, that the hard seasons of life, that God can be trusted, that we have someone who's walking with us, that we have the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, and that ultimately, he wants to make us more like his son, Jesus. And so today, I wanna end by offering two prayers. And the first prayer is that today, we would really settle in our hearts this belief, this understanding that, that God's goodness can transform those things that are even hard in our life, that it would go from just our head but to our heart about the goodness of God, that he has the ability to work those things together for good. But the second prayer will be for those here today who maybe say, I've never gotten that relationship with God right. And I want my sins forgiven. I want that hope of heaven. And I have yet to say yes to Jesus. That second prayer will be for you. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we just declare this morning the goodness of our God, that if God is for us, who can be against us? And Lord, we don't always understand the things that we're walking through and the hard times that we may face, but Lord, we believe today the promise that you can work them together for your good and your timing. We may not always understand it, even on this side of heaven, but you've got a divine plan and purpose for each of our lives that will have a renewed sense of your goodness, the calling that you have on our lives, that what you started, you will finish. And Lord, may we be a light for you in our world. And as we continue to pray, if you're here today or watching with us online and you say, Jeff, I think that second prayer is for me. I've never made that decision. And I've never said yes to Jesus and invite him in to be the Lord of my life. And if you're here today, I wanna include you in that second prayer. And if you'll just raise your hand and say, Jeff, today I wanna make that decision. I need to get my relationship right with Jesus. If you'll raise your hand, I wanna include you in that prayer. If you're with us online, you can hit that button that said, I made a decision today. And simply surrendering and saying that God is the only one who can save. It's through a relationship with his son, Jesus. As we pray together, we're saying, Lord, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I repent and I turn towards you. Fill me with your spirit. Give me life and hope and the everlasting life that comes with a relationship with you. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.